And um, um, I'd like to welcome Martin Weller, who will be talking about some of the lessons uh, building an open research community with GoGN. Over to you, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Martin and I have many confusing meetings with people who refer to Martin. And I think, did I do that? And they mean him and vice versa. So we need to get better names or different names. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about GoGN. I don't know if you can see me on the video, but I'm actually fully branded up. GoGN t-shirt, uh, GoGN penguin. So, you know, it's all about the merchandise, really. So good. Um, so hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'll talk about is what the kind of the aim of the GoGen network, uh, what we do, some analysis from a survey that we ran, uh, and some feedback, uh, and kind of the lessons we've learned from trying to, to run this community. So uh, the aim of the GoGen network it was um, set up by Fred Mulder, who was at the uh, OU Netherlands um, in 2012, I think, which seems a long time ago. Um, and really, this was when uh, open educational resources were quite an emerging field. Um, and although there was lots of advocacy around, people saying, oh, we are, we'll do this. They will make learning better for students. They will um, you know, uh, decree costs and those kind of things, which I think we kind of all believed in the field. But there wasn't much research there to kind of back that up both on a kind of quantitative and qualitative side and to see how people are actually using them, what the barriers for use, those kind of things. And um, so what Fred wanted to do was kind of grow that global research community. Um, and particularly when you're doing research into something quite new like OER, um, then you might be the only person in your university, even in your country, who's doing that research. Your supervisors may not know about it. So these people are often operate in, in isolation. And so we want to try and grow that research community to share the findings and support people to do that. Uh, and so it's funded by the Hewlett Foundation and still is. So how we work is, uh, so it stands for, sorry, I should have said, the Global uh, OER Graduate Network. Uh, that's what the GoGN stands for. Um, or GoGans, if you want to go with that. Um, so we work with doctoral students, so people studying uh, to get a PhD or an EdD, um, and they have to apply to join, and we look at their application. Um, and so there are sort of certain criteria. You have to be actually signed up to be doing a PhD, not thinking about doing one, and it has to be roughly in the field of OER, so not, not everyone gets in. So we want to kind of keep the focus you know, fairly tight. Um, we have an, an annual seminar. Um, this is <laughs> this is all pre-COVID, okay? So let's just, we'll come on to that later. So the idea was, uh, Every year we bring together about sort of 10 to 15 uh, students or uh, researchers uh, for a two day seminar, which is kind of very intense. I should say if there's any GoGN members in the audience, perhaps you could uh, do a thumbs up icon in the in the chat box so you can see there's some of our uh, members here. So we bring uh, people together for uh, two days uh, and they present about their research and we run some general sessions on how to be an open researcher. Uh, advice on completion of PhD, those kind of things. Um, a lot of love for the, the go in the in the audience. Um, and then it's often allied to a conference, usually the OE Global Conference, although last year it was uh, the OER conference in Norway. Um, so then a lot of the, the research then go on to present at the conference. So it's going to be the last period. Um, we also run monthly webinars uh, where we particularly like to get uh, alumni come in and, and present about their research. Uh, we have quite an active Twitter account. I send out a, a newsletter, which not everyone reads. Leo, I'm looking at you. Uh, but generally, <laughs> students like to read the newsletter where we share kind of what's happening. Uh, we share resources and create resources, and I'll come on to that later. Um, and we try to go create a very supportive network, kind of peer support. Um, uh, between people. So, for instance, uh, last year, uh, Judith Pete, who was one of our uh, researchers who graduated um, and got her PhD, uh, that was in the Netherlands, although she's based in Kenya. Uh, people, members flew in from all around the world to kind of be with her for her, uh, her uh, defence and, and graduation. So it's kind of a very supportive network. We also give out uh, two awards every year, which we've named after Fred, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Um, one for best research paper published in an open access journal and one for uh, best research projects or open practice. And another thing we like to do is not just to encourage 
uh, to support research into OER, but to try to encourage open practice. So we have sessions on you know, how to share your data, um, what they'd be happy about sharing, trying to get people to use various forms of social media, blogging, those kind of things. So trying to make, so when people leave GoGen, they're still part of the network. Um, so in the seminar that we run, which is kind of like the, the, the meat of the um, of GoGen practice, the students present to each other and we try to get students from different stages in their PhDs, so some right at the end, some right at the beginning, some in the middle, people from different countries, different topics, using different methods, there's a kind of a range of practice there. Uh, and we ask students to give feedback to each other um, and then we run these sessions on open practice or getting published, uh, surviving your PhD, life after a PhD, and then some of them go on to present at the conference and sometimes it will be the same thing they've presented to us. So we kind of can give them feedback on what they might want to do for the conference and other times it, it will be related work. Um, so this is probably slightly out of date. Uh, so we have, uh, this has gone up a bit since then, so probably about 120 members now. Uh, we've run four seminars, and there were some before we took over as well, which from Krakow, Cape Town, Delft and Galway. And I'll come on to what might happen this year. Uh, and we bring about 15 researchers to each. And we've hosted, um, this is probably about 25, 26 webinars now. Um, and have quite a lot of publication from members. And it was interesting, I went through the programme of OER19 last year and across all the different presentations, there were 31 sessions that were from uh, GoGN members, which I think kind of demonstrates a certain maturity and, and growth in, in the network. Uh, we conducted a survey last year um, of our members, just asking them a number of different things. We had uh, 38 responses from uh, 29 institutions across 14 different countries. And although, you know, the survey, all, all the questions that you should know as researchers and the caveats about surveys, I think that's quite representative of the, the network as a whole, I think. Um, oh, somebody needs to have better use of fonts. Uh, anyway, the, <laughs> and colour. This is the uh, where the countries were. Uh, so uh, quite a lot of Canadians, those Canadians pop up everywhere. Um, quite a lot based in UK, US. Uh, it's interesting, so um, there's four in the Netherlands, for instance, and one of the things we need to differentiate is between where you're, where you're registered for your degree, uh, your PhD, and where you're actually doing the study. So some of those people are registered in the Netherlands, or that's the UK, um, the OU Netherlands, are actually like people like Judith who are in Kenya. Um, so uh, there's a slight difference there, really. so, but I think one thing we definitely do is improve some of our participation. Uh, from from the global south, and we've been looking at ways to try and do that. Uh, we asked people their research area, uh, and put them roughly into these four categories. So the smaller uh, blue chunk is MOOCs. Um, we do allow some MOOC research in. I think when it particularly relates to open practice, uh, but Hewlett were quite clear with us. They didn't want it to be they didn't, particularly when MOOCs were hot. You know, they didn't want the the kind of the network to be swamped by kind of MOOC research. They want to kind of retain um, some of the practice uh, around OER. So the biggest, the grey chunk is OER kind of in various formats. I'll come on to that. Uh, ODL is open distance learning, so particularly uh, use of OER and open practice with open universities. And I think a, a, a shift we've seen recently is, is towards the orange section, which is kind of more around open educational practice. And that becomes a bit of a, a grey area or an orange area, uh, it's because what, what counts as open educational practice, you know, we have some applications that are about academics use of uh, social media, for instance, those kind of things. So I think um, as sometimes we sort of discuss amongst ourselves, does this fit in with um, the GoGN or not? So that it can be a bit very rare, but I think it's interesting because my sense is also um, that this is where Hewlett Foundation uh, are also moving their their focus of interest less to less around the things, the kind of the content, and more around the kind of practice. So I think GoGM was ahead of the curve as always. Uh, we asked people what activities they've done, uh, and I think as you would expect, most of the people who tend to respond to the survey are the more kind of engaged people. Um, so most of them have been to a conference, but pretty much you know um, um, activity across all our, our, our tasks. And we asked them what's most useful. And I think you know, no surprise that the you know the workshops that face to face was the most uh, useful part for most students and most members. But we asked them to rate the features um, 
of what we do and how useful they find them uh, in, on a Likert scale. Uh, and you can see that actually they're all pretty highly rated. It's only the Facebook page doesn't get much love, and I think that's we, we don't use it much. But I think it shows kind of a, across a range of things we do, actually they're all useful to our members at different times and for different things. So I think that kind of indicates you need this kind of this breadth of activity, I think, to maintain a community. Um, we asked people about methodologies, um, what methodology they'd used, and we sort of grouped together. Um, and, and it's interesting because um, we, our, our research is often used mixed methods. They might use a survey and focus group, or survey and uh, structured interviews, for instance. Um, but as you can see, there's quite a range there of, of methods, and I'll come on to a handbook we'll produce about this later. Um, so it's. Um, and interestingly, this is no, not through kind of any pre-selection on our part, but a lot of GoGen members tend to be more on the kind of qualitative side, I think, of research. And that's probably in contrast to those of you who know it, um, the Open Fellows Program, which is run uh, by John Hilton in, in the US, where um, that tends to be, that's often kind of postdoc people, a bit of funding to do specific piece of research. And that tends to be quite quantitative. So I think it's quite a nice kind of complementarity between those two. Um, we asked people about their kind of conceptual frameworks they use, um, and as you can see, again, a lot, basically, <laughs> it's a lot, um, and I'll come on to this again as well, but I think it's interesting that people kind of really applying a lot of different kind of frameworks and ways of thinking to open education, and that in itself demonstrates a kind of maturity in the field, I think. Um, we asked people for feedback on the seminar, and they all say nice things about the seminar. Um, but I think that this kind of gets to the point of why it's valuable that someone impacted their research immediately. They met, up, they met someone there that they kind of connected with, they went back to kind of change their uh, their practice. Some certain found really galvanising. So I think often uh, members who are kind of um, caught in the middle of their PhD, they've kind of got over that first year and they're kind of in that mid PhD slump. It can be a real kind of like boom. This one said, like, they feel an outsider since few are interested in the same things they are at uh, their, their institution. Meeting others with such similar research paths was kind of really uplifting. That goes back to that kind of sharing practice. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the key issues, this, this overcoming isolation, really. So uh, this, this member said they're so far away and isolated in a broken institution. They're ever thankful for the community, the collegiality. And I brag about how friendly it is to people in other research fields. Um, this person said, you know, it's uh, meeting face to face, this impact on me in my faculty. I'm the only research undertaking like non techie research and I feel lonely and isolated. So I think this kind of this idea of building things, particularly in a new discipline where it doesn't fit as neatly into sort of existing uh, discipline silos. Uh, we asked people what they might want to be interested in doing in the future. Uh, people said they'd like to do more you know, informal support and offer advice. Uh, so, possibly mentor PhDs, um, whether we can help with people finding teaching opportunities or examining PhD candidates. So I think that now that we've reached a kind of certain stage and a certain size of the GoGen community, there's quite a lot of uh, alumni who feel they would sort of give something back to the network and so we can sort of shift about, we can shift our focus a bit, I think. Um, we're going to start producing some, some outputs as well. So we've just got another three years funding at the end of last year. What we agreed to do was that was produce a number of outputs which are co-produced with our members, um, which are useful for everyone in the OER research uh, field, not just us. Um, so the first of these coming up very soon, uh, probably by May, is a methodology report. So we asked uh, members to um, fill out a survey, a, a form that sort of outlined their methodologies, and we're just putting that together and trying to group all those those different aspects. Um, and sort of top and tail it with some introductions, some conclusions. And I think that'll be a really useful uh, report then for any researchers coming into the field or starting research in this area. You know, how have people, what methodologies have people used? Why did they use them and how were they useful? Um, we're going to produce an annual OER research review report. It's not necessarily a kind of a systematic synthesis, but rather between the team and our members. You know, what are the interesting areas we think that are going on in OER research at the moment? Uh, and we'll produce one of those every year. 
Uh, and next year, we're going to produce a kind of conceptual framework report. So I, I listed a lot of conceptual frameworks. So similar to the methodology, I asked people what frameworks did they use, uh, how were they useful, and how did they apply them? So again, you could. So anyone new come to the field can then do a kind of a pick and mix from I'll take that methodology and that conceptual framework and off again. Um, and I also have some, uh, I was recently appointed a Commonwealth Learning Chair, which comes with a small bit of money um, that we can spend on some fellowships with people in Commonwealth countries. And so what we're going to try and do with those when it all gets agreed is to ask uh, people to submit uh, proposals to conduct regional analysis of, of their region and how is the kind of OER use going on there, but, but only Commonwealth countries. And... That's fine. Um, Five minutes. Okay, thanks, Martin. So our lessons, um, I think probably it's the most important one. Emotional support is actually really important, and often we underplay it, I think, and underestimate how valuable it is. And I think as much as it's useful for people to come in and get advice on methodologies and frameworks and, you know, and have chats about how they should do their analysis or something, that, that is really important. It's actually the emotional support they get from finding other people who are doing a similar thing. Um, and often... Uh, Deb Baffs in the in the audience, I think uh, we talked to Deb about this. Like, it's actually a really difficult thing to measure. <laughs> when you put in reports, uh, proposals for research, like you're asked to kind of say, you know, what what your output's going to be. And I can say we're going to have these many reports, and we're going to have this many views, and this many Twitter followers. But there are nice metrics for that. And what's your metric for emotional support? And uh, as I often joke, like, is it number of hugs given? But we can't even give hugs anymore in a, in a post-COVID world. So just I was thinking kind of post COVID as well, um, what we need to shift um, and actually um, emotional support was even more important, I think. So we were supposed to run a seminar, a mini seminar before the conference, which we shifted to all online. And actually that was quite, that worked very well, I think, uh, as we had more people come in. And one of the first things we did was soon as the, the sort of crisis broke was to set up a WhatsApp group for all our members. And it's not really a kind of, you know, chatting about um, research. It's share app memes and funny jokes and those kind of things. If it's just kind of allowing people to have that sense of connection with other people. And we do need to think about, so our plan was to run the seminar in November with the OE Global in um, Taiwan. I don't think that's going to happen. So we need to think about what we do with that. So how, how do we measure that kind of emotion we give people? Uh, sorry. A uh, face-to-face and online mix I thought worked well, but maybe we do <laughs> you think that as well? But people do bond a lot of those kind of like intense two days, and they then got to form sort of friendships that last for years, you know. Um, and people like to make connections, and, and that, that's the important thing. Um, and we, I feel like we, uh, we part of our job is really just to kind of uh, facilitate that. And really, the network evolves through the action of the participants, so it's up to us to kind of follow that lead. So I, just, I wanted to quickly just say, I think if you were in another field that was kind of new, then I think there's some lessons you can draw from GoGM. Um, and one of those is that it takes effort to grow a sustainable community. You know, there's a small team at the OU. We spend a lot of time doing it. We have very active members and those kind of things. But, you know, you can't just do this stuff for nothing. And I think um, uh, Lorna was talking about kind of invisible labour yesterday. Uh, true, you know, so trying to do this without money would be very difficult. You know, just organising things like webinars just takes ages you know just it takes, it needs so you know thankful we get funded by Hewlett to do it because I'm not sure we could do it just on the side on the periphery of our time and actually I think doctoral students are a really good place to start they're kind of the people who go on to become very big names in their field often um, and they're kind of the passionate people and, and enthusiastic um, so that's it so if you want to get in touch if you are a PhD student in the OER area or know of one uh, come to gogen.net and there's a little application form you can fill out Follow us on Twitter, um, and that's it. And all our graphics were by the lovely Brian Mathers, of course. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So uh, there was a lot of love for GoGN. I think you have a lot of GoGNers in, in the audience. So um, I think we have time for for one question. So um, Martina. Uh, was asking, do doctoral students, do you know if they stay in touch after graduating? Yeah, uh, but with us, do you mean, or with each other? But, uh, but the answer to that is both, yeah. So um, we've got some uh, uh, graduates are in the audience here, I think, um, but also with each other. So a lot of them kind of form, for instance, when we were at Cape Town, a little group formed around 
a certain methodology and that's it they've kept in touch with that so uh, people like Catherine Crowley one of our alumni and stuff so yeah we very much keep in touch it forms a very ongoing um, network I think that's great thank you Martin so um, I'm sure people can put questions in the chat if they want to follow up with anything so, cool, thanks so far. I'll, I'll switch off um,